Hello, and uh, thank you very much for coming today to the, uh, the, the first of the fall presentations that I'm doing here at the Hol Holliston Council on Aging. Uh, and thanks very much to the folks here for inviting me. Uh, I am, my name, for those of you who haven't been here before, my name is Arthur Bergeron. Uh, I'm an attorney at Myrick O'Connell. Myrick O'Connell, there are four, 60 of us actually. There are 40 in Worcester and, and 20 in Westboro, so we're actually the largest firm around here. But everybody there does something, I just do this. The only thing I do is elder law. If you've got other kinds of problems, there's probably somebody there that can figure it out, but it's not me. So. Uh, I try to do these presentations because I find in, in talking to folks, a lot of times there are questions that come up a lot. Um, and, and so they're really kind of, I realize they're really questions of common interest. And that's why I started doing these. I do these in, a, in probably about 10 communities. So I've been doing them for a long time. I started in Holliston a few years ago. But for this fall, I wanted to do this one because that has become the most common question that I get. So my, my clients, are, um, my median age client is age 74. So my clients are pretty old. Um, I always like that because they think I'm young still, a lot of my clients, right, which is great. Um, and and they've, they've got you know, common questions. So it's questions that are common to folks who are like retired and so they're not thinking they're in, they're in, their income has probably shrunk and they're not thinking their assets are gonna grow a lot. And they all know they're gonna die. That's the great thing about older folks. That's what I like. You know, your kids don't believe it yet, but you know, you get to a point and, it's, and it gets less scary the scary part is typically getting frail. People are like, I can get dying. You know, I've lived a great life. I just don't want to be frail. Um, um, so there are kind of common questions, but the most common, and, and by the way, in this presentation, I'm always going to refer to my friends, Frank and Mary, right? So Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Um, <laughs> that's their family, and, and they have a very simple goal. They want to live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. They lived in the house forever. The kids are grown up. They're all gone, you know, so does this sound familiar, right? And so. Um, their basic estate plan is if one of them dies, they want to leave everything to the other one. And if the two of them have died, they want everything divided up among the kids. Now, does that all sound familiar, right? So that, sometimes that's not what it is, but a lot of times that's what it is. Um, that's their basic estate plan. Uh, hidden in that estate plan, though, is that there are a set of people that they really don't want to leave money to if they don't have to like the Department of Revenue, the nursing home, or Mass Health, you know, among others. And so I often tell people my, my purpose as an as a elder law attorney is to first help you in terms of your estate plan, make sure that the money goes where you want it to go, and then second, to avoid leakage, to avoid having the money go to places that you didn't necessarily want it to go. And these are the three, kind of, some of the three common places. And by the way, there's a fourth, and that is they don't want to waste a lot of their money on lawyers. Right? Of course, that's a good reason. And so they're wondering about why, when they're talking to me about whether they need, should do anything and they're trying to balance the cost of doing something with what it saves. Um, and, so, and, and so you're going to, and when people are asking me, so do I need a trust? They'll say, well, I, you know, my neighbor's got a trust. Somebody told me I need a, do I need a trust? The answer is, it, this sounds like a lawyer answer. It depends, you know. It depends on what you want because a, a trust is simply one of the several solutions to various different kinds of problems. And depending on what your problem is, the trust changes. So the purpose of this presentation is to give you a sense of that and a sense of the kind of most, the most common kinds of trusts that we're talking about and the reasons why people do that and what the alternatives might be. So. Uh, if you're Frank and Mary, and you're, this is your situation, right? This is, uh, you've got a house. They're, they own their house jointly. It's worth $300,000. Frank has an IRA. Uh, and he's named Mary as the death beneficiary, and that's worth about one fifty. dollars um, Frank has an annuity, and you say, what kind? And he wouldn't know either. He bought an annuity. A financial planner talked to him, and he got an annuity, right? And it's, he knows that it's worth about $100,000 now, and he knows that Mary is listed as the beneficiary so that if he dies... Whatever it is goes to her. We're going to talk about annuities a little bit more. And then they have savings, joint savings, $250,000. And that's their current situation. And remember, their goal is that if one of them dies, they want everything to go to the other, right? Um, and if the two of them have died, they want everything to go to the kids. Um, and, they, and, and at this point, they're both age 65. And the reason why I, emphasize, I, I want to mention that is that I'm going to use some other later examples where they're both 85. Just to, by way of illustrating that people's concerns change between 65 and 85, among other things because of that. 
because your likelihood of getting Alzheimer's if you're 65 years old is one in nine. Your likelihood if you're 85 years old is one in three because by that point you've died of something else. If you were, you know, and, and if you haven't died, more and more likely that you're going to be ending up getting Alzheimer's at some point. So your issues are different if you're 85 than if you're 65, even if you have exactly the same in, in assets. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. So also, people will come in and they'll say, oh, I don't want to pay tax. Remember, I don't want to pay the Department of Revenue any money, right? So if you're, as long as your estate is it, when, the, when the first of the two of you dies, if you leave everything to your spouse, there's a 100% marital deduction. So you can be, God forbid, Donald Trump and leave everything to your spouse. You pay no inheritance tax. When the second person dies, though, there is an estate tax, depending on the size of your estate. For federal purpose, that's purposes, that size has to be more than $5.4 million. So we don't talk about that one a lot, right? For state purposes, though, the magic number is $1 million. If your estate when the second of the two of you dies is worth more than $1 million. So if one has died, left everything to the other, and then the second person dies, and that estate is worth more than $1 million, there's an estate tax. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later on, but not now, because remember, their assets are less than $1 million. And they're only 65 years old, so they're not really worried about nursing home care. So what is it that could cause them to want to pay me any money? Right? To spend any money on estate planning. Well, first, of course, they want to get their will. They want to make sure that their basic plan is okay, that when they die, all the money goes to the kids. Uh, interestingly, though, by the way, um, that's exactly the same thing that would happen if they didn't have a will. Right? So if, if the, the basic, it, it, and, and having a will does not allow you to avoid the probate process. Inevitably, at least once a week, someone will say, but I have a will. I don't have to worry about probate, do I? Well, actually, um, yes, you do. You do, because the purpose of probate, and probate isn't based on how much you have in assets, um, and it isn't based on who's supposed to be inheriting anything. It's based on whether you die owning something that's just in your name, because one of the two purposes of the probate process is to figure out who gets that asset, who gets it. Now, if you die without a will, um, then there is actually, there are actually a set of rules that the state has already written. They've lit, written a will for you. And, that, and their will says, if a spouse dies, it goes to the other spouse. And when the second spouse dies, it gets divided up among the kids. That's exactly Frank and Mary's plan, right? So it may be that they don't even need a will as long as they understand that the, that the, that the assets when the second person dies are going to have to go through probate, right? Um, now, they may want to write a will, and by the way, I'll give you the kind of three standard examples. If you've got a child who has a financial issue, inevitably they get called the free spirit by my, my clients. You know, oh yes, that one's a free spirit, right? So they didn't save any money, you know, or they're in a risky business, they're in construction, you know, something. Uh, or if you have a child whose marriage isn't great, and so you're worried, that, you're worried about that, you know, because if you've got credit, the child's got creditor problems by leaving it to the child, you really may be leaving it to the creditors, right? Because they're going to be able to get it. And if you're leaving it to the spout, to the child who's got a marriage problem, you may be leaving it inadvertently to the daughter-in-law that you never liked in the first place, right? Because that money's going to be in play. Or if your child um, has a disability, um, which means that the child is either currently or may be on some form of government programs like MassHealth or SSI, that are means tested, they're based on how much you have in assets. In, those three ca if, in that case, you may be, by giving that child money, inadvertently disqualifying him for that program. So you don't want to do that. And in all three of those cases, the way that you can deal that with that through your will is by putting provisions in that say that that money is going to get held in trust for the benefit of that child. Typically, in this kind of situation, you name one of the other kids as the trustee. And as long as the beneficiary, the child you're trying to protect, doesn't have the legal right to get that money, then those assets are going to be safe from the creditor or from the spouse, and they're not going to be counted in the event of a disability, right? So there, there may be reasons why, why you want to have a will, but one of them is not to avoid probate, okay? So I'm going to go back to, remember, this was Frank and Mary. And, and here, and those were the, those were those were her their assets. Uh, in this situation, if Frank dies, if Frank dies first, is there going to be a need for probate? Anybody think there's going to be a need for probate? Raise your hand. Anybody think there won't be a need for probate? Raise your hand. You're correct. You're correct. 
because the money and the home are owned jointly. The IRA, technically, Frank never really owns his own IRA. You, you know, you get these statements from the bank and they show all this money in your IRA and you think you own it, but you don't. Actually, the bank does. They are the custodians for you. They have some obligations to you. If you tell them that you want it, they have to give it to you, but you don't own it at the time. And so when you die, no one has to figure out where that asset's going to go. You can name, you have a contract with that custodian, and part of that contract is you can name a death beneficiary. Now, if you haven't named a death beneficiary, now there's a problem, that then the money's going to go through probate, right? But, as long, but you can name a death beneficiary and therefore avoid the probate process. Similar with most annuities, most but not all. Most annuities will have a provision that says you can just name a death beneficiary. So if one of the two of them dies, uh, there's not going to be an issue. When the second one dies, though, there is, right? Because if Mary dies, then the home's just going to be in her name and the savings are just going to be in her name. And so um, someone's going to have to figure out who becomes the owner of that, and that would be the probate process. So why do you want to avoid probate? Two reasons. One, remember I told you the probate process was there for two reasons. One is to figure out who gets the assets. The other is to make sure that all the creditors get paid, right? Because no, you, you, no heir can get their money, uh, whether it's through intestacy or under the will, until all the creditors have been paid. And how do you tell if they've been paid? Well, because the creditors have one year from the day of your death to file a claim against you, right? So if I, hit, if I get into a car accident with you today and I run over you and, and you get hurt, um, the standard statute of limitations for that, uh, the period during which you can sue me, is three years, three years from the date of that accident. If when I, after I run over you, I hit a telephone pole and die, the period during which you can sue my estate in order to get paid is only one year. One year. It's from, from the perspective of creditors, it's called a short statute of limitations. From the perspective of the heirs, though, it's a very long statute of limitations because it means things have to sit around for a year. That's why probates, things that go through probate always take at least a year. It isn't just because the lawyers are lazy, you know, or because the courts are bad. It's because they, it has to be a year to give the creditors time to file. So you can't close out the estate until that year has gone by. Um, the second reason why you want to avoid probate is, is cost. Um, the going through the probate process, I have known people who have tried to do it on their own without a lawyer, but it has been painful and oftentimes very time consuming. Uh, if you're hiring a lawyer though, it's probably going to cost you five to ten thousand dollars. There's going to be trips to court, there's going to be ads, there's going to be this and that. It's going to cost you some money to go through the process. So the question, once again going back, is so is it worth doing something in order to avoid this, right? And then, if it is, what can I do? And the answers, um, and by the way, we already talked about that. What if Frank dies? Well, then everything goes to Mary. And the, there was uh, Mary's, Frank and Mary assets, but what happens if Mary, if Mary dies? As I said, this is the only second time doing my presentation, so sometimes I forget where I am on my slides. I'm sorry. So, um, once again, there, there were Mary's assets, and, and now she's got to try to figure it out. And the question is, is there a way that she can structure those assets um, so as to avoid probate, right? Well. There are a couple of assets that, that, that's already happened, right? She can make sure that the IRA, even if she's died now and she's become the beneficiary of the IRA, she can now turn that IRA into her own and name her own death beneficiary, and she could name the kids. And with the annuity, I'm assuming that this is a kind of annuity where she could also just name the kids. For the bank accounts and the house, though, she also has some options. For both of those assets, she could simply name her kids as joint owners right? Because that's where she wants it to go anyway, right? She wants it to go to all the kids um, for both the bank accounts and the house. So, and she might want to do that. Now, the bad news as far as the bank account is concerned, though, is that if she does that and one of those kids has a problem and gets sued, now that account can be attached because their child is on that account. And, if the, and, a, and a joint owner on an account can go withdraw the money. It isn't like an account with, where you're, you're owning it all as tenants in common and everybody needs to sign off. So if one of the kids wants to go to the bank and take the $400,000, they can, right? So she may or may not want that. It's certainly the cheapest way to go, right? Regarding the house, she could put her, her children's names on the deed together with her, right? Um, regarding the house. And that way when she dies, the kids will become the sole owners of the house, right? And she may want to do that and it's definitely the least expensive, right? Um, one of the issues, though, is going back to that case I gave you, if there's a creditor of one of those children, now they can attach that house because that child has an interest, right? And if she 
uh, dies and the kids now own the house and there's a disagreement among the kids about what to do with the house, which there often is, like one of the kids is living in the house and doesn't want to sell it and the others do want to sell it, right? Or um, they all want to sell it, but one person thinks it's worth 300000 and the other person thinks it's worth five, right? There's no way of settling any of those disputes because if they all own the house, they all own the house. And every decision has to be made unanimously, right? Um, similarly, if you own a home, you have this other option. You can transfer to your kids an interest in the house and keep something called a life estate. So instead of everybody being the joint owner right now, this may sound like a bizarre distinction, but this, this is, is true. You can actually keep total ownership in the house until the moment of your death. That's called a life estate. But transfer to the kids right now the remainder, what's left after you die, which is actually called the remainder. And the kids are called remainder men. Uh, and you can do that. Now there are, there are and, and many people do that, by the way, as, an, as a planning tool to deal with mass health issues. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. Um, there are, and, and that all works, right? There are a couple of issues with that. If, 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 the, if Mary does that and then wants to sell her house, then the capital gains exemption that she has, the $250,000 capital gains exemption, which therefore should keep her capital gains tax really low or, or to zero, is only going to apply to the value attributable to her life estate. And her life estate, if she's 65, is going to be worth about 35% of the value of the house. There's going to be a capital gains tax regarding the rest unless those kids live with her in that house, right? The second issue, as I had mentioned, is this whole issue of she dies and now the kids own the house. Um, well, you know, kind of now... Now what? You know, how's the house going to get distributed? The third issue, uh, I'll give you t t two other, the two other problems. Um, the third issue is, I'll give you examples. So I've got, I have a client, I do a lot of work um, on Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket, which people go, oh, that's all, they're all rich there, they don't need this. Well, actually, no. In Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, both, basically the money flies in in the summer and flies out in the fall. But the money that's on the island, the people on the island, they're just on the island. You know, they work on the boat and they work in the restaurants and they got stuff. So, but a lot of folks, just regular incomes, except tremendous property values because of what's happened with these people that fly in and fly out, right? So I have this, this uh, couple, older couple, from, uh, originally from West Roxbury, and they moved to Oak Bluffs, Afro-Americans. Oak Bluffs in, in Montes Vienna is a very big Afro-American population, dating to when... Um, that was actually where Harry Belafonte, where a number of, of Afro-American uh, uh, actors and entertainment, entertainers started going back early 20th century. Uh, there's actually a beach, which was until about the 50s, called, it was the Black Beach. It was where the Afro-Americans went. It was still called the Inkwell, right? And in the, in the, in the Afro-Americans, it's kind of a joke, you know, at this point. They have t-shirts of the Inkwell. So anyway, there's this wonderful couple that moved from Roxbury and had, had gone down to Oak Bluffs. 20 years ago when they retired and but they wanted to make sure their house was going to be safe that's their big assets they got a, they, he's got a good pension he had a government job she's got, she's got a small one um, and now it's but and now it's 20 years and they wanted to make sure the house was safe so they transferred this remainder interest in the house they kept a life estate so now it's 20 years later and they're both still in great shape you know and they're like 85 and and uh, except they don't want to be living in, in Oak Bluffs anymore because you know, they ha don't have a lot of savings. It's a little bit expensive to live there. It's far away from the big Boston hospitals. They're getting older. You know? Martha's Vineyard Hospital is OK, but it's not like a big deal. right? So now they want to sell their house. right? So they call their kids. They say, we really want to sell the house. So we'd like you to give us back your remainder interest so that we can sell our house. And uh, two out of the three kids will do it, but not the other one. Right? So, they, so, she's, so they said, so what can we do? I said, nothing, there's nothing you can do. That child owns a remainder interest in the house. And not only cannot, you cannot force the child to give you back the remainder interest, and you can't sell the house until he does, because if I'm buying the house, I'm buying the whole house. I'm not buying the house that this kid can come back and live in after the mother dies, right? I want the house. So they're stuck. And, she said, and they said, well, what about getting a reverse mortgage? I said, well, you can do that, except, but everybody's got to sign, right? Because everybody owns the house. He's not going to sign, right? This kid, because he wants the parents to die and he's going to get his big share of the $800,000 Oak Bluffs house. Not a big house, but it's Oak Bluffs, right? So that's, that's number one. Number two, so I talked to this lady, lady in Vineyard Haven. This is in uh, Vineyard Haven, is one of the other towns on Martha's Vineyard. She called, oh, Mr. Bergeron, can we talk? Um, I just want to see if I got a problem here, right? She has one child. 
Many years ago, she deeded a remainder interest to her child, kept a life estate, same reason she wanted to protect the house in the event of nursing home issues. And she said, I just want to check and see if this is a problem. My son called me and he said he just got divorce papers from his wife. I said, ooh, that's a problem <laughs> because your son owns the remainder interest in the house. And it's, once again, it's Martha's Vineyard. It's a seven or $800,000 house. And now she's old. So the older you get, the smaller the value attributable to your life estate. So, that, so probably the remainder interest is worth 75% of that house, right? And that's in play now in that divorce, right? So sometimes that's not a great idea. The, the other alternative is a trust, right? One of the things that Frank and Mary could do is they could create now a revocable and amendable trust. They could name, and, and by the way, <clears throat> the, re the reason why I'm doing this with Mary is before Frank and Mary died, remember when Frank died, the house simply became Mary's. So there was no issue about needing a trust at that point. Same thing would have happened if Mary had died first, right? So um, the real question is, once Mary's alone, do you really need this? Or many people will do it anyway, even though they're both alive just because they want to be on the safe side, right? But the big time to do it is when you're single, right? So Mary could create a revocable and amendable trust. Name herself as the trustee for the benefit of herself and all of her children. She would say that she's in complete control as long as she's alive. And she would be. She could sign deeds. She could sign mortgages. She could sell the house. She could do whatever we want. And, and for tax purposes, by the way, this trust is a so-called grantor taxable trust. Uh, that is, um, so she goes to sell the house and wants to take her capital gains exemption. She can. Because for tax purposes, she still owns it. Also, by the way, for mass health purposes, she still owns it. So she needs to qualify for mass health. The house is a countable asset because she's in control of it, right? Um, so, but typically in this trust, she would say, when I die, I'm going to name one of my kids or more to be the new trustees, the new legal owners, and I'm going to tell them that what I want them to do is liquidate the property and divide up the proceeds. I just mentioned this, no ties, because, the, you know, what you don't want to name is an even number of anybody, right? Because if they can't agree on what the sale price is or whatever, the tiebreaker becomes the probate judge. Everybody has to march into probate court and get this solved. You don't want to do that, right? So that's kind of that, so that's wh why you would do it if you were worried about probate. So and I'm just just checking. Okay, so let, now this now the situation is a little bit different, right? Frank and Mary are still 65 years old, but look, their assets grew. The house is now worth 400,000. The savings are worth 550. The total assets of the couple are a million two. Now, as I mentioned to you, um, when one spouse dies, there's a 100 percent marital deduction. So if Frank were to die, and those were the assets, Mary would inherit them all. There'd be no um, estate tax. Uh, and remember, those would now be Mary's assets, a million two, because Frank hadn't given anything to anybody else. He gave everything to his wife, which is what he wanted to do. When she dies, uh, there will be an estate tax of $49,040. Because while there is no estate tax at all until you get to a million, for a period of time over a million, the tax is 40%, 40%, right? For a short time, um, for the, basically until you get to about a million two hundred or a million one hundred twenty thousand dollars for reasons that I won't go through. It's, I'd be glad to explain it after, but it's too complicated. So, but so, so ironically, for people whose assets are between a million and a million one, saving this estate tax money, it's, it's like a big deal. It saves you a lot of money compared to the amount of money involved because $49,000, that's, like 20, almost 25% of the 200,000 that's like over a million dollars, right? So the question is, can we get rid of this? And the answer is yes. And the answer is by using a certain form of trust. This is the trust when you hear of things called credit shelter trusts, when you hear of things called AB trusts, right? That's always what they're referring to. Um, because, and I'll just call it for purposes of the seminar, a tax avoidance trust. You can call it anything you want. You know, people all, everybody thinks of a different name so they can market it. So we're going to call it a tax avoidance trust. So, and th but the idea behind this goes back to something I had mentioned earlier. When e each, both Frank, each Frank and Mary, each, if they have an estate in which they're leaving assets to other people, can leave as much as a million dollars in assets. So effectively, when Frank died, when he left everything to Mary, what he did was he threw away his $1 million exemption. So instead of giving it to other people, he gave everything to Mary and therefore pushed her over the million dollars. If he had given the money to his kids, if he had given some of the money to his kids, as long as he had given them less than a million dollars, 
he wouldn't have, his estate would not have had a tax. And because he had given it to the kids, Mary's estate would then be lower. And therefore, when she died, she probably wouldn't have a tax, right? But of course, the reason why that didn't happen was that Mary want, Frank wanted to make sure that Mary was safe. I mean, you love your kids, but you married your wife, you know? And your goal, and their goal is typically to say, you know, don't worry about us, take care of yourselves, right? And so Frank wants to make sure that the wife has the, has the access to this extra money. He would like, though, to know, and so would she, that when they both die, then there's not going to be an inheritance tax. So the way that you do that, right, the tax avoidance trust, right? You basically, you, when you have Frank either through a standalone trust, which would therefore always also avoid probate, or through a trust that is part of his will, you would have him say some amount of money of his assets, but not more than a million dollars, that would have gone directly to Mary, will instead go into trust. What are the terms of that trust? Well, in, in order for the credit shelter trust to work, the, uh, the, there has to be more than just Mary as a beneficiary. He would have to name his, you know, Mary and the other children, for example, as beneficiaries, right? Um, but he, was, he does not have to put in that the kids are entitled to some kind of early distributions, that they're entitled to get to the money soon. And he can actually name Mary as the trustee of the trust. That is the person who is able to decide whether to, who to give the money to, right? And her choices are she can give it to herself, right? Or she can give it to her kids. Now, if as long as, and so let's say, and so really, in terms of Frank's goal, of making sure that the money was available for his wife, he did. He put the money in trust, she's the trustee. Her, his, his, her lawyer is going to say, don't use that money unless you have to, right? Use your own money, because as long as it's in trust, it's always there for you, but if you die, there's gonna be no estate tax on it, right? Because it was part of Frank's estate, right? It was not gonna be part of your estate. So he's taken care of that, and he's also made sure, because this trust will typically also say, when Mary dies, everything goes to the kids. So it's exactly the, the way his will was going to read, right? So once again, there, remember, those are Frank and Mary's assets, right? The house is worth 400,000, uh, the savings are worth 550, and the rest is the rest, right? So if Frank, for example, took that house and he said, I'm going to put the house into that trust, right, for Mary's benefit. I'm going to name Mary the trustee. I'm going to take all the rest of the money and just give it to Mary. So now Frank dies, and because the money, and because the house has gone into that trust, that house value, the $400,000, is counted as part of his taxable estate. But $400,000 is a lot less than a million, and so there's no estate tax. And then Mary gets the rest. Now, by the way, I made a mis this is a mistake. Mary gets actually $800,000, right? Someone was going to, someone has already done that. I bet you've caught me, right? So I'm correcting that. So Mary, because it adds up to a million too. And, and so Mary gets the 800000 She can do whatever she wants with it. But then if Mary dies and she still has the 800000 her taxable estate is 800000 It's less than a million dollars. So there's no tax when she dies. That's how people avoid the estate, the, the estate tax or reduce it. And this works really for estates total values of up to $2, $2 million, right? Because if you've got $2 million and Frank dies and says, I'm going to leave a million of it in this trust for the benefit of my wife and the, and the beneficiary, ultimate beneficiaries of the kids, and Mary's going to be the trustee, right? He dies. His estate is worth a million dollars. It's not worth a million and one dollar. And by the way, if you go, once again, if you go over one dollar, the tax is just on that one dollar. If you've got to stay for a million and one dollars, the tax is 40 cents. It's 40 percent of that one dollar, right? Um, so, so he dies and everything is safe, and then Mary dies and everything is safe. Um, similarly, and by the way, one of the things that the attorney might say, if they're structuring things this way, they'd have both wills or trusts. They'd have one for Mary and one for Frank. And they'd say to them, just in case somebody drops dead, you may want to actually divide up your assets now into piles. They don't have to be equal. There's this myth that these piles have to be equal. They don't. They just have, you just have to make sure... That, I, that the piles are such that you're going to avoid the estate tax. So the piles that we were thinking about, you know, we just, I gave you one example where Frank keeps 400000 the other stuff stays in the middle, and let's say that Mary actually made, this, made the bank account all just hers. Remember the money, the, the, uh, the, uh, the savings, and then, and then the, the, some of the other stuff added up to $550,000. So if she does that, 
when she dies, that $550,000, is that's her estate and it's not taxed. Everything else, when Frank dies, which adds up to $650,000, that's less than a million dollars, so that doesn't get taxed. So in either case, when the kids get the money, there's not going to be an estate tax that's going to be owed. So that's why people will use these trust mechanisms um, for that purpose. Now, by the way, a common question is, what about revocable versus irrevocable trusts, right? By which people usually mean not only irrevocable, which means you can't take the money back once you put it in trust, but also unamendable. You can't change the rules after you've set this up. So all of the trusts that I was just talking about, remember when I was talking about just Mary and she was setting up this trust for the benefit of the kids, remains um, revocable and amendable, as I said to you, at any time until she dies. Of course, it can't be changed after she dies, right? You wouldn't want to give the new trustee the ability to say, ah, I'm changing the trust, I want to keep the whole house, right? Similarly here, um, when, when they set these up, these trusts up, they, to are, they remain totally revocable and amendable until one of them dies, right? But if Frank dies and the house goes into the trust for the benefit of the wife, right, the rules regarding that trust can't be amended after that, right? It becomes irrevocable and unamendable, right? So that's why people will, will, use, will use this technique if their assets are more than a million dollars. So <clears throat> now I'm going to use kind of example number three. Um, so now Frank and Mary are, are, have aged. They're 85. They have gone back to having their original assets. They have $800,000, right? Um, but in the same asset configuration, they're just older. So now they're coming to talk to me, and they're starting to really get worried about nursing home care because a lot of their friends have gone, and they're worried about this. This is what they're thinking about, right? So, so, so actually, there are a couple of, oh, there may be a seat back there. Right? Um, so, so that's what they're concerned about. And, there's, and they're coming into me and they're saying, oh my God, what happens if one of us goes to a nursing home, right? What happens if one of us goes to a nursing home and the other one's alive? And what happens if one goes to a nursing home and the other one is dead? And the answer to that is, um, you will, if you're in the nursing home, um, um, if, you have, if you got there after being in a hospital for at least three days, admitted to a hospital for at least three days, Medicare will say that you're there to get better. And therefore, Medicare, which you all have, most of you, anybody here under 65? Right? Oh, oh, you don't have it yet. Soon, soon, someday. Um, uh, Medicare will cover your first 100 days in that nursing home. After that, Medicare will assume you're not getting better. And therefore, they'll stop covering you. So the maximum benefit you get from Medicare is 100 days, and it's only after you've been in a hospital for at least three. By the way, though, that benefit repeats. If you go to the hospital, you go to the nursing home, you stay 100 days, you get out, so you're like well, and you stay well for 60 days. And then you go back to the hospital and back to the nursing home. The clock has reset. You get another 100 days. But you never get more than 100 days in a row. After that, you're either on private pay or you're on MassHealth. MassHealth is the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program. Now, because private pay costs you around here an average about $12,000 a month, people are really interested in making sure that they're not on private pay or not for long, right? Because that, you know, at $12,000 a month, that $800,000 goes pretty quick. That's $144,000 a year. So people will come in and say, so now what do I do? Now, to understand what to do, you need to understand MassHealth 101. So here are, the, here are the rules, quickly. MassHealth 101, if Frank and Mary are both alive and Mary goes to the nursing home and she wants to qualify for MassHealth because she's run through her 100 days or because she went directly to the nursing home and didn't stop and go in the hospital and stay for three days, um, then she needs to show <clears throat> that she has less than $2,000. Um, the residents, if she owned it, would not be countable but if she keeps owning it, it could be leaned. MassHealth could put a lien on it to make sure that MassHealth gets repaid after she dies. Frank, though, if he is still alive, can own the home as long as it has an equity of less than $828,000, can have cash or cash equivalent assets of up to $119,220, and most importantly, can have unlimited income. Unlimited income. And so, in Frank and Mary's situation, Frank can actually get Mary qualified for MassHealth pretty quick. Mary, if Mary goes into the nursing home, Frank transfers all the assets to Frank. The main thing that he needs, by the way, for that is a power of attorney. He needs to make sure that Mary has given him or somebody the ability on her behalf to sign her name to get assets transferred. That's why I always tell people when they're doing their estate planning, 
you don't really need a will in many cases, right? What you really need though is a power of attorney and a healthcare proxy so that if you're disabled, someone can act on your behalf. This is crucial in these cases. So what you do is we, we transfer all the assets to Frank. Frank then, remember he can keep the house as long as the house has an equity of less than $828,000. Um, he can keep up to $119,220 in cash or cash equivalent assets. Um, but, but, and he can have unlimited income. So what we would advise him to do is to take the money above 119. Actually, we typically say take the money above 100. Keep 100. Take the money above that number and buy an annuity. As long as that annuity is of a specific kind, as long as it calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy, which if he is 85 years old, his life expectancy at 85 is 5.85 years. As long as it's greater than his actuarial life expectancy, then the purchase of that annuity, by the way, if you're 100, your life expectancy now is actually one and a half years. If you're zero right now, your life expectancy is like 80 something, right? That's why people usually think that's the number. How can it be? I'm over that number and I've got a life expectancy. But the answer is, every year that you live, your life expectancy doesn't go down by a year. It goes down by a little less than a year. That's why those numbers always work. So anyway, um, Frank can buy an annuity, any amount, so we can take the, all the money, uh, buy the annuity, and the day after he buys that annuity, Mary is eligible for Mass Health because she has less than $2,000, he owns the house, he has cash of less than $119,220, and the income doesn't count, and the annuity is simply income. So when people come in, they're always amazed by this. Just about always, they always say, I've ne we've never heard of this. We, we came because we heard that what we have to do <coughs> is we have to take our assets and we have to transfer them to an irrevocable trust and wait, or, or to our kids and wait five years. And the answer is no, you don't have to do that as long as you're both alive. The problem is what happens if Frank dies? And then Mary goes to the nursing home. And Mary has inherited all those assets, right? So now she's got a problem. She's got way more than $2,000, right? So what's supposed to happen in this case is, the house is no longer joint, it's just Mary's, is that all those assets, other than the house, need to be spent down to less than $2,000. Then Mary will qualify for MassHealth, except MassHealth will put a lien on her house to make sure that MassHealth gets repaid following her death. That's what people, I tell people, that's what you need to avoid. You don't need to worry while you're both alive. You need to do something before one of you dies to make sure that when you die, the other one is safe. And what you have to do involves a trust. What you need to do is each of them needs to change their will. And by the way, this trust has to be part of the will. It has to be a so-called testamentary trust. And in the will, you want to say, I'm going to, all the assets that we're going to go to Mary, instead, I want to have go in trust for Mary's benefit and I'm going to name one or more of the children as the trustees, uh, and, I'm going to say, um, and I'm going to say that the trustees can use this money for any reason they want for Mary's benefit while she's alive. But, is, but because this trust is a so-called third-party funded trust, it hasn't been funded by Mary, it was funded by Frank before he died, and then you need to make sure, by the way, that Frank owns the assets before he dies. So if there's one spouse that, you know, if Mary's looking kind of sick and there's, you know, Frank wants to protect her, probably he would do this will and then he'd shift all the assets to him so that if he died, then she's going to be safe, right? So as long as he does this, the day after he dies, all the assets that he owned are all safe for Mary's benefit. If Mary needs nursing home care the next day, Mary's going to be safe. All the assets are going to be non-countable. If the kids, the trustees, want to use things, some of that money, on Mary's behalf, they can. If, if she's in the nursing home and she's on Mass Health, she really needs a great wheelchair. I mean, give you that, there are, there are two, I'll give you two quick reasons why you want to have some extra cash if you're stuck in a nursing home. Of course, nobody wants to be in the nursing home in the first place, but I would say that the two of the worst parts of the nursing home, one, you see, anybody here ever been to a nursing home, after walked around, seen in a nursing home? Yeah, I see a lot of yeses. So, you may have seen that person in the hallway in the wheelchair going like this. Slumped, right? Always the sad thing, right? Now, why is that happening? That's happening because of the wheelchair. Because they're sitting in a wheelchair that wasn't designed to sleep in. It was designed for transport. It's the, you know, it was the thing with the, you know, the aluminum handles and the, and the cloth back, and it's designed to get somebody from one room to another, right? And that chair cost the nursing home less than $1,000, and that's what they use. Now, for $10,000, you can buy a wheelchair, it reclines, it's got all kinds of padding, 
can get a little TV set, you can get headphones, you can do great things. And if you're stuck in a nursing home, especially if you're stuck there because you're physically disabled, you know, but you're still cognitively fine, and you're really depressed because people around you, there are a lot of those folks that are really cognitively not so fine, right? This gives you the ability, at least, it's not great, but it gives you the ability to get into your own world. You're, going to be out, you're not going to be lying in your bed, which the nursing home doesn't want because of the bed sores, and you don't want because it's so boring, right? And it allows you to you know, watch movies, listen to your own music, do whatever you want. Now, the, the extra money that's in trust could be used for that. I'll give you the second example. So I went into the nursing home recently, because um, I go to nursing homes a lot, and there is my client who is a... 85 year old person with dementia woman and she's very nice you know but she's got dementia and she's in she's there and and in a double everybody's in a double right and next to her is another very nice woman with dementia who's Spanish right and you can tell because she's watching TV and it's in Spanish so now I got my client who's got dementia who's kind of confused anyway right and she's hearing no English all day all she's hearing is Spanish right now that problem can be solved that problem needs a flat screen TV and a set of headphones and a subscription to Netflix. And now my client can watch The Sound of Music a thousand times. She can watch all of her favorite movies. She can, do, she can listen to music. She can do whatever she wants, right? So the trustees could pay for that. But the trust, what the trustees don't have to do is pay for any of the nursing home care because the assets in this trust are non-countable. And after Mary's death, they're not lienable either. So the assets can be distributed to the kids. So that's a very specific, once again, this trust wouldn't be done for any other reason. And this trust does not avoid probate. This specifically is re it's required to go through probate because it has to be a testamentary trust, a trust that's part of a will. So you would never do it unless you're worried about nursing home issues, in which case you definitely do it, okay? Um, once again, um, oh, and so now finally, what if um, Frank's assets are that higher number. What if they're, what if they're over, um, what if they're the million two instead of just being the 800,000? Well, in that case, you can actually set up this, this, this will so that it has, for want of a better term, two trusts within it. This goes back to the kind of the old AB, AB trust principle. You have one of the trusts, um, which, which is going to be um, primarily for the, or for the benefit of the kids and Mary, right? And it's going to say, no assets have to be distributed to Mary. They can be distributed to the kids anytime. And Frank could put some of that money in there, right? Say that $400,000, like the house. The rest of the money, which he was going to be giving to Mary, instead he puts in trust for Mary's benefit. And as a result, because there's a, once again, there's a 100% marital deduction, that doesn't get taxed either. And it also won't get taxed upon her death. Now, the only thing about this version of the trust, though, if you're also trying to do this for tax avoidance purposes, is that in this case, Mary cannot be the trustee. One of the kids would have to be the trustees. Um, and Mary's, it, Mary's assets must be spent. I don't remember why I put that in. I, can't, <laughs> I just can't remember. That's not, but the main thing is that Mary can't be one of the trustees. So, um, so in, that, in that situation, right, um, you can actually preserve all of the assets, you can get Mary qualified for mass health, and you can also assure that there is not going to be a, oh, now I'm remembering, but th that, there's, that there's not going to be an estate tax. If you structure things this way, this $100,000, which goes into the account for Mary, it's called a marital, a marital trust, right, or a Q-tip trust, the income from that trust has to be paid to Mary while she's alive, if she's in the nursing home, which means even when she's qualified for mass health, the income from the trust has to get paid on her behalf then to the nursing home. The principal, the, eight, the, the, the money will all be safe, but the income has to get paid to the nursing home. So you would want to look at this at that point and try to evaluate. So what am, I, what, what, am I saving more by knowing I'm saving the estate tax? Or am I saving more by knowing that if I die and my spouse goes to the nursing home, none of the income from this trust is going to get paid. And that's the kind of conversation that you would have with your lawyer, right, if you were trying to figure this out. So, in summary, in summary, there are at least three reasons why you may want to consider a trust. So when my clients came in and said, do I need a trust? Well, do you want to avoid probate? In that case, and do you, and do you, are you uncomfortable with just putting your kids on as the joint owners of your assets? Well, in that case, you may need a trust. Do you have assets total and you're a couple of less than $2 million and you want to eliminate the estate tax? Well, then in that case, you may want to trust, right? Do you want to make sure that if one of you, one, that you're both alive and if one of you dies, the other spouse is going to be safe if they need nursing home care? Well, in that case, you need a trust. They're all different trusts. 
They're all designed for different purposes. Um, and you may not need them, or you may. So I hope that this was helpful. Any questions? If not, thank you very much. I hope that you enjoy this. I'll be doing a, another presentation on a, uh, uh, in a couple of months, and you'll be getting a notice. And I'll be staying for a few minutes afterwards in case there are any individual questions. Thank you very much.